Okay, let's get going on the next stage. And yes, I am using my second camera as a voice recorder because I forgot my micro SD card for my normal voice recorder. Anyhow, it's good that we've got enough gadgets to get us through this episode. I will remind you of where we got to last time, although I'm sure people of my channel take studious notes and rewatch all episodes to make sure they miss not one second of progress. The foam base template is measured and I've worked out the tapering size for the upper sheet of Dyneema fabric that will form the top of the insulating quilt. The final stage last time you saw me doing was cutting four sheets of super thin ripstop nylon. These will form two pockets for the insulation to live inside. But even neatly clipped together as they are, and given that I cut the length slightly longer than the correct lengths, they are still far too wide. So I mark them up over the Dyneema they are one day destined to sit beneath, follow the taper and add a little extra for the hems, and a little extra for luck. I can always trim later. I did also remember my long scissors this time, not relying on my silly 3 inch warehouse pair. The offcuts are large enough for tests and esteemed mini projects of the future, so I can roll and pack those away. Here we go then, four of them cut, although given the camera angles and the geometry they still look remarkably rectangular, but I promise they are suitably trapezoid, and all the more bodacious for it. If you're asking why I only cut one side tapered, it's because the lengths are still long, and so it's just the angle of narrowing that needs to be correct for now. So we have two of them now cut out, laid out, and I've pinned them back together again so they can't move too much. And my next job is going to be to lay on uh, some layers of insulation. I'm not going to adjust the angles of the two ends just yet. We're going to lay this on and see how it looks. And then I can make a decision about uh, areas that might want to be extra ins insulated or whether we go uniform. And I can also work out whether I bought enough insulation. I bought the insulation by unit weight because I knew that was the quantity of synthetic insulation I needed to replicate from other equally rated bags. So it wasn't done on uh, thickness actually, it was done on weight of insulation. And time will tell whether that was a good choice or not. Here's the 1.8 kilograms of Climashield Apex. People get very cross online arguing about whether it's better or worse than Primaloft or other similar clones in the subcategories of either short microfiber or continuous filament polyester insulation. Now, those people who actually make these rolls of insulation fabric cannot burrow into the creative minds of polar skiers kept in underground London warehouses, so the width of the roll may not be optimum. My quandary is therefore, where do we cut? Where do we join? Where do we overlap? Seeing the role of Climashield here, I'm doubly happy that I've opted to pocket the insulation inside 30 GSM nylon and not have the fluffy layers of loft placed inside the Dyneema outer quilt without any protection. This is the thickest grade I could get hold of and is 200 GSM. Translated into provincial 18th century, that's 6 ounces per square yard. It's quite hard to actually tell you how thick those insulating layers like this are, even its own weight will slightly alter the loft of a layer below here shown in comparison to a mostly representative human hand. And now I need to work out how much will be needed in two dimensions first. I'll just measure the length of this to work out where my head is going to start and therefore where the insulation needs to stop. Again, I'm working on the principle of cut a little bit large for now in areas that can be later trimmed. There's a calculated excess at the foot end as that needs to form the foot box and there will be a cutback needed at the end I am at now as the quilt will not cover my head. And for now, that width conundrum. It would be fun to use single sheets per layer, but we lack that luxury. The roll is 160 centimeters wide, and I have six meters of it. Okay, so I'm deciding on the orientation. Whether we run the, uh, the length that way and then add on a bit on either the head end or the foot end, or whether I rotate the, uh, the 160 centimeter width uh, 90 degrees that way, and then cut the taper four times. Uh, that's a question mark for me right now. I think what I'm probably going to do is rotate it 90 degrees because then we're going to have the minimum number of cuts because I don't really want too many joins or overlaps. So if we're going to orientate the roll this way around, then it's going to be long enough, of course, but far too wide. We want to get as close to the full 1.8 kilograms. Oof, speck of dirt. Can't have that. 1.8 kilograms into the quilt somewhere but the offcuts will need to be positioned cleverly and I need to investigate where. Currently thinking my feet and a thicker strip around the upper edge. I'm hoping this gives you a better sense of what we're driving at here. Once again, the lopsided angle will be corrected once the oversized top and bottom are cut. 
My logic says to simply replicate the cuts from the nylon pockets onto the insulation. Expert seamstresses or seamsmen or people of the seams may be screaming at their screens that the nylon needs to be bigger than the insulation, fabric is needed for the hems and to take care of the insulation thickness. But my experience says that the laws of physics don't apply to sewing. A little extra width in the insulation ensures that we don't end up short and we can always trim off half an inch later. I don't want to entirely rely on the nylon as a template though, as that itself was taken from a template. So that we don't end up with engineer's drift, I'm checking the numbers from scratch once more. And chop. As a man who has cut and chopped many, many odd materials over the past few years, I put this one in the top five in terms of satisfaction. Excellent, although I'm still concerned about how those slim angled off cuts will find a home. I did that a few times. We've cut out two of these main sections and one of each will go into each of the two pockets, the nylon pockets. Uh, these do need to be double thickness though, but we don't have enough uh, full width and full length uh, climber shield left. There's that original remnants of the roll there and then the two off cuts over there. So what I'm going to now do is do a little bit of a patchwork to basically cover that area again using that and that. It's not absolutely perfect because it means that there will be a little overlap and a join, um, but it will be twice the price to buy twice as much Climber Shield. And I don't really have any other projects that that can be used for at the moment, so we will do it this way around for the prototype. In wonderful news, it actually turned out that I had just enough Climber Shield all in one piece to manage the third of the four layers of insulation. That leaves the fourth one to be made up with offcuts. This is actually pretty good. With a cost of barely 100 British pounds of insulation, this should be enough for this hypothetically extreme cold rated sleeping system. And I will arrange and then tack stitch those off cuts in an arrangement where there's plenty of overall coverage, but extras and overlaps ended up where they're most needed. Tell me where you think they should be in the comments. Footbox and to help baffle the area around the neck, maybe? Let's now get more acquainted with the lofty goodness itself. This is four layers, 800 GSM of Climber Shield Apex. This is a lot. And given with all these continuous filaments you gain durability at the cost of compressibility, the size of this eventual sleeping system will be interesting to see. 100 to 200 GSM of synthetic insulation is normal for technical puffer jackets. 300 to 400 is perhaps expected for a normal four season sleeping bag. I'd be gobsmacked if this is not enough for minus 40 conditions, and my design would allow for removal of some if need be. In terms of native loft, and let's be clear, after use and packing you'll never quite manage this in the field, we have about 14 centimetres, nearly 6 inches of insulation. But this is the critically important thing as you see the once again bodiless hand once again getting on the action, my system will not involve any of this loft underneath a sleeping person. This extreme compression is why I want to say goodbye to all around 360 degree lofted insulation, because it reduces to nearly nothing. Right, so that's probably as much as we're going to be able to manage today because although I've cut out all the different sections and I'm happy now with the nylon pockets, I am reasonably handy with a needle and thread and even with a sewing machine, but I think this is the moment when actually a proper expert needs to come in. Um, I've had a couple of professional uh, sewing people involved in previous projects. I don't know whether location-wise that's going to be possible, or possible for them to come here. So I will put out word <laughs> for someone to basically come and save me from my own sewing incompetence and we can get those pockets made. I'm also going to bring up the topic of reflective foil or, or reflective aluminiumized mylar. Now a couple of people in the comments, actually someone who was very patient and I think had to try a couple of times uh, to make me really understand what he was saying, uh, said you know in the situation now where we're not having a breathable sleeping bag this is surely the opportunity to take advantage of a non-breathable reflective layer. The reason why you can't have mylar uh, or any kind of aluminiumized uh, foil within a normal sleeping bag is because it will then form a vapour barrier when you don't want one. Here we can use it. This foil will reflect a large quantity. There's a lot of arguments online about what percentage of your body heat and at what temperature you're sleeping at and so on, but it will reflect a, a not negligible amount of your body heat right back at you. Voice over Alex will step in here to say why I think this is so important and why in a vapour barrier system we can unusually unleash thermal reflection. Having tired of all the bickering on internet forums about this, I saw that there was a summary of all this bickering that AI came up with. Even if the numbers are a little high for this, and I'd argue a little bit conservative for this, that is still mega. Anything we can do to reflect heat back 
in a way 99% of sleeping bags are prohibited from doing, we are onto a winner. And I'm also going to try and sandwich those in between some of the foam layers in the bit that you're actually lying on. So I'm probably going to integrate this uh, as close to the body as possible, so probably uh, just above the inner uh, dynema layer of fabric. And that will then, I think, be most effective. So yes, we're going to be involving uh, reflecting our radiant heat back onto ourselves which is great news to finish on, I would argue. Uh, probably a slightly shorter one this time. I don't know how long it's going to be after I've done the edit. And cheers to Vanguard for, of course, um, humoring me yet again for one of my projects and for allowing me to store all of my super cool stuff in there. Right, that's enough from me. Bye.